What solution do you have for the out-of-control infestation of bums in the United States of America? There is a solution. Not every country on earth is plagued by bums. Countries that are plagued by liberal politicians are plagued by bums. Countries which are run by sane individuals are not plagued by bums. And so I ask you what you would do as a citizen of the United States of America if you were asked to advise uh, the leadership of the country how to get rid of the homeless infestation in San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C. It's perhaps per capita worse in my hometown of San Francisco. Now, I got to tell you something. I moved here in 1974, and I was charmed by the city. I thought it was gorgeous. When I came back from New York... Uh, I, I couldn't wait to get into San Francisco. And so I went into the city. As you know, I have multiple dwellings. I move around for obvious reasons. I'm not in the same place for many nights in a row. I move around from one to the other. I have done this for years. I did not stay more than 30 minutes until I, re I fled out of San Francisco. Nothing happened overtly to me. There was a feeling in San Francisco of filth and disorder and an undertone of violence that had me leave the city almost immediately, far worse than in New York. This city is a city that easily deceives you, and you can see it in the architecture of the city. There was a joke that went around when I first moved here in 74 and was looking for a house. I had a realtor who drove me around. He was a very funny guy. He's a nice gay guy, and he said, oh, in this city, what we have is called uh, a Queen Anne front and a Mary Anne behind. Well, I laughed hysterically. That's San Francisco to a T. It's a Queen Anne front and a Mary Anne behind, and the facade has crumbled a long time ago. The stucco has come off the facade. The city is now nakedly exposed for what it is. It's not a charming city of I left my heart and said bring, bring the flowers in your hair at all. It's disgusting. And what we need is a, t a strike force. First, we need the FBI to come in and get to the bottom of the corruption. It is the most corrupt city in the United States of America. And by the way, you know and I know there are billions of dollars being stolen out of this state on a daily basis. High-speed railroad to nowhere. That's on a state level. Uh, the streets are broken. Go and try to drive on Lombard Street going to the Golden Gate Bridge. Ask yourself where the highway funds went. Go and look at the approach to the Golden Gate Bridge and see if you can ride on it without an SUV with snow tires, without damaging your wheels. We have roads in San Francisco that are embarrassment to the world. Malaysia has better roads than we have here. And yet billions of dollars are spent. Where do the billions of dollars go? Where are the highway funds? No one has an answer for that. But what would you do with the bums? That's what I'm asking you. Let's use common sense. There is nothing in the Constitution that says we are required to give a person who is either lazy or, let's say, mentally incompetent uh, a house. Certainly, we don't want to hurt them, so we put them in, in uh, institutions. And we used to have institutions. They were called mental hospitals, where they were given meals, they were given a clean bed, they were given showers. But most importantly, they were supervised to keep them under control because society at large cannot supervise the number of people that are now roaming the streets who call themselves homeless, they shake a cup at you, and if you don't give them what uh, they want, they threaten you or they insult your wife, they insult your daughter. It's out of control. And now they're openly defecating and urinating in the streets of San Francisco. And, of course, we have a crime wave in San Francisco that the old city fathers, mothers, or transgenders who run it don't want you to know about. The mayor is interested only in, uh, let us say, fiscal matters. Uh, San Francisco, as you well know, is the toilet bowl of America that gushes itself up as something special. It really isn't something special. It's something quite uh, other than special in many ways. I live here because I love the weather. I love the wildlife. I despise the politics of the Bay Area. It's almost unlivable. And now, of course, as they say, chickens have come home to roost with the crime wave that's sweeping the city the illegal alien hordes that have taken over the city who are walking around brazenly like Jorge Ramos uh, on, 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 on steroids. By the way, speaking of Jorge Ramos, his daughter works for the Hillary campaign. Did, did anyone say that yet on radio? Did I doubt it? Mr. Ramos, who thinks he's the savior of the illegal alien, or actually the leader, leader of the illegal alien uh, community communities in America, but he got humiliated when he tried to speak out of turn at a Trump press conference, he was put in this place. But it turns out that Ramos is not really just interested in this from the point of view of, let us say, uh, ethical reasons, moral reasons, racial reasons. It's financial. His daughter works for the Hillary Clinton campaign. Jorge Ramos, the amnesty activist, moonlights as a Univision and Fusion journalist, 
He revealed in June that his daughter is an employee of the Hillary Clinton campaign. And yet he calls himself a journalist. I'll be right back. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. But since the bums are now crapping in the street like dogs, San Francisco has become not the laughing stock of the world, but the toilet bowl of the world. The one I want to lead with, the picture of a bum crapping in the streets of San Francisco openly as though it's a toilet. The fact is, is that the city is out of control because liberalism is a mental disorder. It cannot manage anything for one primary reason. Liberalism runs on the premise of tolerance. Everyone says, well, what's wrong with tolerance, Michael Savage? Aren't we supposed to be tolerant of others? Yes, we are. But ultra tolerance is what is destroying the United States of America. We are ultra tolerant of the bums. We are ultra tolerant of the drug addicts. We're ultra tolerant of uh, on an international level, the worst terrorist the world has seen since Adolf Hitler called ISIS. Why are we so tolerant of the rapes, the murders, and the kidnappings on an international level? Barack Obama is very tolerant of ISIS and has no tolerance for the American people who voted out all of his left-wing fanatical policies. So I open it up to you. What would you do with them? How would you get rid of the homeless bums in the United States of America in a humane way? What would you do with this scourge? If, let's say Donald Trump becomes president. We hope he cleans up the country. Well, hope he becomes president, but he's not going to clean up every problem in the country overnight. Uh, but th that's a separate issue. And you're the advisor. You're now the special advisor on homelessness in America. Of course, the, the word homeless is, was an invention of the liberal community itself. That implies that they're entitled to a home. No, they're entitled to a cot in a mental hospital or a cot in the jail cell. That's about what they're entitled to. They're not entitled to a home. And the proof is they cannot manage themselves in a home. If you see them in a home, they usually destroy what they're given. They will not care for themselves because they don't want to or they can't. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that most of the illegal aliens are not living in the streets? Has anyone noticed that? Raise your hand if you've noticed that most of the bums in the streets of America are not from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, or China. Have you noticed that they're native peoples, meaning indigenous peoples of several different races, but they're not from the illegal alien population? Does anyone know why? Raise your hand if you can tell us, and George Jorge Ramos, why America's streets, which are flooded with the homeless bums, don't seem to have any, any illegal aliens in the gutters. Does anyone know why? I'll give you an answer, because the illegal aliens are coddled. They have so many social services given to them that they, they've gone to the head of the line. They are taken care of better than our own poor and uh, unfortunate. Did you know that? That's another little issue, and it's tied to the illegal aliens. Uh, the illegal alien issue, rather, is tied to the homeless issue. They're tied together. Again, simple observation from a man who observes Real Life 101 because I walk in the streets. Amongst the bums who are panhandling, the aggressive bums, the defecators, the urinators, the ones who curse you if you don't give them money, I almost have never seen an illegal alien, ever. They're all uh, our own. They're all citizens of this country. So why are the illegal aliens not in the streets? Because they're well taken care of. By the way, I, I talk about this at length in my forthcoming book, Government Zero. I have to mention it because I try to make my books different than most. My books are not Democrat, Republican, Republican, Democrat, Democrat, Republican, and George Washington's false teeth. Government Zero covers this issue very, very clearly, and you can only find it online right now for an advanced copy. Psychologists. Okay, the personality expert, Dr. Adam Perkins, okay, some expert, from King's College London said, we're still a long way off from fully explaining neuroticism. Neuroticism? Neuroticism? Neuroticism. I like the last part of that word. But we hope our new theory will help people make sense of their own experiences and show that although being highly neurotic is by definition unpleasant, it also has creative benefits. Let me explain something to you. As a highly creative man myself, someone who has been writing since I'm a young boy, someone who has been drawing since I'm a young boy, someone who has published numerous books and has many unpublished plays and stories and poems, 
someone who's been writing and working all my life in the creative world, they're 100% wrong. Let me explain this, and I'll have to explain it in a little more detail, but I'm going to give you the short version now, the, 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 the Savage Notes version. I remember when I was 18 years old and I was very worried about my highly sensitive brain and highly sensitive nature and how high I was flying with it and how close I got to the sun. I got very worried and I, I stumbled upon something. I don't know whether it was uh, Aldous Huxley who wrote it, who wrote that we create despite our neurosis, not because of our neurosis. This is the exact opposite of the truth. Because if you want to feed into your highly creative nature and say, well, it's because I'm highly nervous, highly neurotic, whatever you want to call it, that I can create. What you will do is you will fuel that neuroticism, coffee, cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, uh, sexual addiction, in order to, th th thinking that you're going to make yourself more creative. It's the exact opposite of the truth. What I read that saved me, and I'm telling this to all the young people out there who think that by being wild and crazy, you're going to create more. No, you're going to kill yourself and your creativity will come to gibberish. The opposite is true. We create despite our neuroticism, not because of it. As one of the most creative people in the United States of America, which I am, whether or not people agree with it, is, is highly irrelevant. The body of work speaks for itself. And I don't have to sell myself to you. I know what I have done, and I know what I have, and I also know what's going to be coming out over the next few years, some maybe even after I'm not here. And so the thing is, the opposite is true. They say support for the idea that neuroticism is associated with creativity has come from brain scan studies highlighting neural circuits that re regulate self-generated thought. So that sounds very serious, right? It says a panic button in the amygdala, a key emotional center in the brain, is believed to trigger an inappropriate fear response after perceived threats are conjured up in the brain's uh, pre prefrontal cortex. High scorers on neuroticism have a highly active imagination, which acts as a built-in threat generator, says Dr. Perkins. Now, as I said to you, it's very attractive to believe this, but I think the exact opposite conclusion can be derived from the same observations, because as uh, I think it was Huxley, pretty sure Aldous Huxley wrote it, uh, or it could have been Laura Archera Huxley, his, his wife, wrote it, that Highly creative people function despite their neurosis, not because of their neurosis. And that's one of the most liberating thoughts you could ever have in your life. Because I've known people who are creative who fed their neuroses thinking they'd be more creative, and they acted out being creative. You've seen the uh, pseudo-artists, the poseur. You've seen them. You've seen the acts they go through to make themselves jumpy and crazy and wild. And most of those types are called poseurs, and they come to nothing. The really great artists that I have met, and I met only a few in my life, are very stable, very, very middle class looking individuals, incidentally. Those who show you how creative they are, whether it's through their look or their, their, their behavior, are usually fakers, what the French call poseurs. So the bottom line here is that if you're a younger person and you're trying to figure out how to act, which you all, everyone's doing, if you're trying to figure out how to act, by the way, you're not alone, everyone's trying to figure out how to act. When you get older, you don't have to figure it out anymore. It's too late already. Your act is over. But the thing is, you don't have to ape being creative if you're creative. Just be creative. Just do your work. You don't have to show people how, how brilliant you are with your, your outfits and your this, green hair and a nose ring and an eye ring. It's unnecessary. It's just to show you a while when you're really not. What tattoos on your eyelid. Uh, the fact is, is that as soon as you get a little older, you'll want the tattoos and the rings removed and then get back to work. The real media machine behind Trump, conservative talk radio, says BuzzFeed. Now, it sounds like they're thanking us, but they're not. They're spanking us. Who Rosie Gray is, we don't know. I don't know Rosie Gray from Rosie O'Donnell, but we know Rosie O'Donnell hates Trump, so I can only assume that her, her distant cousin, Rosie Gray, also hates Trump. So BuzzFeed, which is a left-wing uh, hit, or I don't know what it is, really. and I heard of it. I don't know what it does says the real media machine behind Trump is conservative talk radio. And the article opens like this. It says, I'm for Trump, conservative talk radio host Michael Savage told listeners last month, point blank, best choice we have. So then they go on and says the symbiotic relationship between Donald Trump and cable news is well established. But what's gotten less attention this summer beyond frustrated conservative circles online is 
Another media engine driving Trump, good old-fashioned talk radio.